So in Shakespearean tragedy, actions committed or engineered by the once great have far-reaching consequences both for huge groups of people and the natural world. But there is more to Shakespearean tragedy than just deaths and suffering, which have an impact upon more than just the hero. Shakespearean tragedy shows us that human beings frequently fail to predict the consequences of their actions and suffer all the more for it. To quote Bradley, but what they achieve is not what they intended. It is terribly unlike it. They understand nothing of the world on which they operate. Macbeth is a prime example of this. The Macbeths hoped they would be able to attain power and greatness by killing Duncan, but only drive themselves to madness and despair. Macbeth fatally underestimates the power of his own conscience, which overwhelms him catastrophically in the banquet scene of Act 3, Scene 4. His wife, meanwhile, having earlier tested to the infallibility of their plan, but screw your courage to the sticking place and will not fail, is left a quivering, unbalanced rack, which she exposes unwittingly to the doctor and her maid in a series of disjointed and incriminating sentences. Out, damn spot, out, I say, one, two, why then, tis time to do it, hell is murky. King Lear is another hero who disastrously fails to anticipate the consequences of dividing his kingdom between his three daughters and not trusting the one daughter who genuinely loves him. He disinherits Cordelia, whom Lear's loyal friend Kent recognises as being loving and leaves himself at the mercy of his other two daughters, Goneril and Regan, who are quickly exposed as self-centred, cruel and ruthless. Lear's actions leave him homeless and destitute, an undignified wreck of a once proud king. In Act 3, Scene 4, Lear even declares that the appalling weather cannot affect him. His sense of outrage at his treatment is too great. He tells Kent, Thou thinks, tis much that this contentious storm invades us to the skin. So tis to thee, but where the greater malady is fixed, the lesser is scarce felt. The power of the wind is shown in the verb invades, suggesting a ferocious ability to harm humankind. Yet Lear has become so obsessed with his failure to predict the consequences of his decision to split up his kingdom in an orgy of egotistical miscalculation and abandon his only true loyal daughter that he scarcely feels anything. Titus is another man who wholly fails to appreciate what the results could be of sacrificing Alabas. He dismisses Alabas' mother, Tamora, as emotive pleas for mercy out of hand in the breezy comment, your son is marked and die he must, yet doesn't seem to realise that this could provoke an adverse reaction from members of Alabas' surviving family. Sure enough, Demetrius and Chiron quickly swoop to plot revenge, which they obtain by raping Titus's innocent Cordelia-like, perhaps, daughter Lavinia, and also by playing an unwitting role in the framing of Titus's son, Martius and Quintus, for the death of Bassianus. Othello is another one who fails to both recognise the evil present in Iago and realise what the consequences could be of promoting Cassio ahead of him. Keeds become his lieutenant, Iago is left bitter and twisted when a great arithmetician, one Michael Cassio, a Florentine, a fellow almost damned in a fair wife that never set a squadron in the field, is appointed instead. Iago feels that it is ridiculous that a mathematician without experience in battle should be chosen to serve a military general in preference to him. Bitterness pervades Iago's words. The adjective great is clearly sarcastic, whilst there seems to be an almost jealous dig at his ability to attract women, as seen in the phrase, damned in a fair wife. Irrespective of the rectitude of Othello's decision, he is left horribly exposed and vulnerable to uh, Iago's plotting. So much so, he eventually kills his own wife in a fit of jealous rage. Shakespeare's tragic heroes may act with good intentions, or think they are acting with good intentions. Certainly Titus, Lear and Othello do, but they are left bewildered by the escalating chain of events that follow and result in tragedy. Shakespearean tragedy focuses on conflict. For example, conflict between the Macbeth's desire to become king and queen and the natural desires of the status quo, including Duncan and Malcolm. Conflicts between the love of Romeo and Juliet and the hatred of their respective families. Conflicts between Titus and his family and the captured Goths he has brought humiliatingly into Rome. Conflicts between Hamlet and the murderous uncle who poisoned his father to take the throne.
but arguably even more interesting. Shakespearean tragedy is about conflict present within the hero's mind. To quote Bradley, that which engrosses our interest and dwells in our memory at least as much as the conflict between different sides is the conflict within one of them. More often than not, this inner conflict, this inner mental turmoil, is revealed in soliloquies delivered by the tragic hero. In Macbeth, this is probably best seen in Act 1, Scene 7, when Macbeth agonises over whether he should go through with the act of killing Duncan. And of course, this draws him closer to the audience, makes him seem more like one of us. Someone who may commit an extraordinary and yes, evil act, but yet who has a conscience, tangles himself up in mental dilemmas like the rest of us. The presence of his conscience mixed with a terrible desire for power results in some compelling imagery. He visualises pity like a naked newborn babe striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim horsed upon the sightless couriers of the air, blowing the horrid deed in every eye, that tears shall drown the winds. This religious imagery draws the audience to visualise a child angel being carried along in the sky by strong winds, compelling every person in the planet to feel pity and great sorrow for the cruel death of a kind king. These words are not the words of an ordinary, commonplace murderer, but of someone with honour, a conscience deep within his soul. Nonetheless, Macbeth's conscience is temporarily brushed aside by his wife, resulting in further intense inner turmoil for the pair of them. Whereas the inner conflict in Macbeth is centred on first Macbeth's doubts about whether he should go through with the murder of Duncan and then terrible manifestations of a guilty conscience, in Act 2, Scene 2 of Hamlet, inner conflict focuses on a failure to gain revenge. Hamlet berates himself remorselessly, physically pained by the knowledge that he knows his father was murdered by his uncle and yet has done nothing about it. He cries passionately, Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I! In these lines, Hamlet condemns himself brutally for his idleness, like that of a rogue from Shakespeare's day, and for his failure to use his freedom as not just a non-slave, but a prince. As the speech continues, the self-loathing and inner turmoil is compelling to watch. Hamlet wonders in mock amazement, Yet I, a dull and muddy nettled rascal, peak like John of Dreams, unpregnant of my cause, and can say nothing. The self-abuse continues in the alliterative muddy metal, conjuring up images of a dirty, plodding field, thick with mud, suggesting Hamlet's lack of spirit and decisiveness, before the simile compares him to a dreamy, commonplace fellow who is unpregnant, who doesn't have anything inside him, which is burning with rage and desperate to be come out, be born. Shakespearean tragedy thus focuses on the life of an initially great man who is drawn into conflict with others and whose feelings of inner conflict make for compelling drama when revealed on stage. This hero believes he is in control but fails to appreciate what might occur as a result of his actions. The hero's fate is somehow tied in closely with a whole town or community or country who also experience a degree of suffering or chaos as a result of the hero's downfall. But Shakespearean tragedy also reveals the malign influence of evil within the world in which we live. Iago, who in the naive, blind Othello persists in labelling ironically honest Iago, is a prime example of how evil and good coexist in the universe. In Act 1, Scene 3, Iago's soliloquy gives some insight into the workings of his depraved minds. He admits openly and confides in the audience, I hate them all, and it is thought abroad that twist my sheets, he has done my office. I know not if it be true, but I, for mere suspicion in that kind, will do as if for surety. Iago's words indicate that he is prepared to wreak terrible revenge upon Othello for a rumour that he has bedded his wife, done my office. He admits that it is only mere suspicion, but for a man of evil nature it is sufficient to use as fuel to propagate evil and cause chaos. How about the opportunist Aaron from Titus Andronicus, whose evil delights in compounding misery to its absolute limits? Titus Andronicus, the fallen Roman general, is already tortured with anguish following the rape of his daughter Lavinia, the unjust sentencing of his two sons, Martius and Quintus, and his own fall from power and grace. 
Yet Aaron compounds his agony by inventing a barbarous deal in which a severed hand from the Andronici clan would result in the two sentenced sons being released. Titus quickly agrees to this and in his words reveals just how important his hand has been to both himself and his country. Good Aaron, give his majesty my hand. Tell him it was a hand that warded him from thousand dangers. The number thousand hints at the decades Titus has spent fighting Rome's battles and gives added poignancy to Aaron's deception, which the audience are well aware of through dramatic irony. Aaron himself delights in his evil cunning and chuckles, Oh, how this villainy to fuck me, with the very thoughts of it. The exclamation O oh, points to a relaxed exhaling of breath, whilst the exclamation mark indicates glee and great amusements. For in Shakespearean tragedy, evil has much success in outwitting honesty and good, leaving audiences to draw breath at the inherent possibilities of the human race. In Hamlet, the dead king, appearing as a ghost to his son, reveals how he was outwitted and killed by his own brother. His words indicate how he was killed, poisoned when asleep under a tree. The ghost declares, thus was I sleeping by a brother's hand of life, of crown, of queen, at once dispatched, cut off even in the blossoms of my sin. Whereas in Titus the source of evil stems largely from a captured, humiliated alien race, the Goths in Hamlet the source of evil is from a close family member. And what's more, this evil has multiple effects. The phrase cut off even in the blossoms of my sin points to the cruelty of the timing. The former king was not given any opportunity to make amends for any sins committed on earth, which at least appear comparatively insignificant, as indicated by the metaphorical reference to beautiful flowers, blossom. But the source of evil as well. Yes, Titus dies in Titus Andronicus, but so does Aaron, and indeed his death is a particularly agonising one. Lucius instructs that the breeder of these dire events is publicly starved to death, left to stand and rave and cry for food. Yes, Hamlet dies in Hamlet, but he manages to stab Claudius just before dying from the poison cup. And yes, Lear dies in King Lear, but the evil inherent in his two elder daughters, Goneril and Regan, ensures their self-destruction. Ed Edmund reveals in Act 5, Scene 3, the one the other poisoned for my sake, and after slew herself. However, Shakespearean tragedies do not end with a sense of resounding triumph. Yes, evil is punished, but so is good, and the remaining characters do not seem of the same quality, the same ilk, as those who have been sucked up and destroyed during the course of the play. To quote Bradley once again, the result of tragedy is that the human condition loses a part of its own substance, a part more dangerous and unquiet, but far more valuable and nearer to its heart than that which remains. Macbeth may be a deeply flawed individual, but surely he is a more interesting, more consequential, more engaging character than the new King Malcolm, who replaces him at the end of the play and who wholly inaccurately and inadequately dismisses his predecessors as a dead butcher and his fiends like Queen. Titus may be described in similar terms to Macbeth, and surely he, like Macbeth, is a stronger, more vigorous leader than ever Lucius can be. Othello, with his desperate desire to be honourable and decent, is lost to humanity to leave the closing lines in the play to the pales in comparison Lodovico. To conclude then, I'd like to return to my opening thoughts about tragedy, to the Steps Bee Gees song Tragedy, which talks about the pain of a single relationship breaking down, to a pe penalty being missed during a European football tournament, and my conclusion is simple. These may be sad, desperately sad perhaps events, but they are not real tragedies in the Shakespearean sense of the word. A Shakespearean tragedy compasses so much more suffering so much more terrifying thoughts about the nature of humanity, the world of good and evil, and how the two worlds collide. A Shakespearean tragedy leaves its audience rots to the core, having witnessed the fall of one great individual, and how this fall has impacted upon entire communities, entire countries. A Shakespearean tragedy takes us through gripping stages in gripping conflicts, both in and outside the human mind. In short, a Shakespearean tragedy scorns, spits and savages any modern notions of the words. You've been watching Schofield on Shakespeare. Good morning.